Good afternoon and welcome to Teaching Artist Tuesdays. In this session, we'll be talking about all things virtual and how to bring your work to your constituents and your public through virtual platforms. We have a wonderful panel of people with great expertise and I think you're going to enjoy this special session. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you are joining us on the Zoom webinar, uh, you can enter your questions and comments either using the comment bar or the Q&A bar. In addition, there will be a couple of polls, so be sure to participate in those polls so that we can include your information as we pursue the discussions that are going to come up today. If you're joining us from Facebook Live, welcome. And you can participate in the conversation by entering your comments and questions in the comment chat box. In addition, when the polls come up, if you would like to participate, enter your, your answers in those comment bars and we will share them with the group. And now I would like to welcome my wonderful co-host, Lenora Helm Hammonds from North Carolina Central University. Lenora? Hello. Hi, thank you so much, Sharon. It's exciting to be here for our third Teaching Artist Tuesday. And um, I'm saying hello on behalf of all of the teaching artists from our Teaching Artist Certificate Program at North Carolina Central University. I hope you know about that program. If not, you can visit us at nccu.edu slash teaching artist. So my work today is to share some of the information that from the poll that we'll be doing. So let's start with our first poll. poll. In this poll, it's just a couple of questions and we wanna just know how you feel. We wanna make sure we are hitting the pulse for our teaching artists in the state. Are you comfortable with virtual presentation in your art form and teaching? So would you please choose one of those questions, one of those answers? A little, I could use help, or I am competent, or not at all. And that will help guide our conversation and the services that we provide. Thank you so much. And let's see, I think is my next job to introduce our content resource guide folks. No, I'm going to stay here with the poll. <laughs> I am comfortable with virtual presentation of my art form and teaching a little, but I could use help. 57% of you said that, uh, but just 34% of you said I am competent. So we know that we're going to be talking about something that'll be useful for you today. Yay. And 9% of you said not at all comfortable with virtual presentation of your art form and teaching. So I'm glad that you're here. Okay, now I'm gonna hand it over and introduce our team of Sandra, Eileen and Sam. Hello, everyone. I am Sandra Davidson, and I uh, work at the North Carolina Arts Council as the content director. And um, I just want to say at the top, our, our colleague Sam is not able to join us today, but Eileen and I will be speaking a little bit about how we have been approaching virtual content in the era of the pandemic and talk a little bit about where we were before it um, in this uncharted territory where we find ourselves today. And I appreciate uh, the responses to Lenora's poll. Honestly, on any given day, I could count myself in any one of those categories. Some days I feel like I'm pretty competent at it. Some days I feel like I could definitely use some help. And there are days too, where I feel like don't even know what I'm doing at all. So I just wanna lead with that and say, I think that when it comes to video content in this, moment, um, we're all still figuring it out and figuring out how best to reach people and present the arts because this is the best way for us to do that. And um, Eileen and I will kind of talk about where we are with the technology and how in some ways the technology may not be um, quite caught up with the innovations that we're seeing online. So I have a couple of poll questions that I'd like to ask 
y'all before we really dive into things. So if our producer will bring up the first. So have you participated in a virtual arts event since the arrival of the pandemic? So by virtual arts event, I mean, have you watched a live stream performance? Have you um, witnessed a panel discussion about, you know, an arts, a piece of art by a local virtual or visual art museum? Or have you participated in an online workshop where you're actually learning how to create a different type of art form? So I'll give you guys a second to respond to that. And then we will move on to the next question. And I'm asking these because I want to kind of feel where you are as participants in arts, online arts content, and also give you some ways to start thinking about how you can maybe um, utilize online platforms to present your work. So let's see the results for poll number one. Okay, wow, 94% of you have, no surprise there. That's great, all right. Um, so let's move on to the second poll question. So what kind of virtual arts event have you engaged with during the pandemic? So a live stream performance on an artist's social media account. So have you watched a musical performance on Facebook or an Instagram account or a YouTube account that's associated specifically with an artist? And this is actually, a, you, can, you can answer multiple, you can check multiple boxes in this poll. So have you um, watched a live stream performance that is presented by a venue or an art center? I ask this because one of the pivots that we made at the Arts Council is cr we created a couple of content grants that we awarded to arts presenters across the state who are working with artists who want to, to share their work. And the presenter has um, a venue and tech capabilities to help them do that. And so I've seen some performances in that sphere and I would love to know if you have too. And have you participated in a pre-recorded virtual arts educational workshop and or a live stream virtual arts educational workshop? So some teaching artists that I've seen out there have released pre-recorded instructional videos where they are teaching people about a particular art form. And I know others are doing the live workshop thing where they have the real-time engagement with the audience. So let's see what we've got with responses for that. Wow, okay. All right. So a live stream virtual arts educational workshop is the, the most popular one that we're seeing with this group. But it looks like y'all have been engaging a lot with online arts content overall, which is great. So 72% have seen a performance on artist social media. 70% have seen a performance that's been presented by a venue online and 64% have seen a pre-recorded virtual arts education workshop, 86 have participated in the live stream thing. And I'm saying, I know our Zoom listeners can see this, but our Facebook viewers can't. So that's why I'm saying this at the top. And then let's, let's do the final question for the poll. So have you created virtual content to showcase your work and your teaching during this time? So I'll give you guys a second to respond to that. And let's see those results. Okay, so about a third of you have created virtual content to showcase your work or to teach about art and um, Two thirds of you have, so 70% of you have, and then 30% of you roughly have not. So that's great to know, thank y'all. So I will start by saying that the Arts Council up until the pandemic arrived had created a lot of content for online audiences. We'd done podcasting, we'd done video work, we'd done written blog stories and photo essays that we shared on a blog and on social media, but it was never, never once had we done something like a live stream. 
and here you are meeting us today on a live stream. So we have learned how to use some of the technology available um, to engage with people during this period of socially distancing like Zoom. Back in April, about a month into uh, us working from home, working remotely, the Arts Council produced an online virtual arts benefit concert that we, um, we used to raise money for artists who were struggling during the pandemic. And that was our first foray into presenting and positioning performing arts content in that way. And we had our share of missteps. At one point, uh, I lost power in the midst of this broadcast. So had no internet during this period of time. And that's kind of a lesson that I have incorporated into any of the live streaming work that we've done and any of the advising that I've done with artists and presenters who are adapting right now with content during this time. So after we did that virtual benefit concert, we released a resource guide that Eileen designed and she's gonna talk with you about another guide that she designed and that our um, content team at the Arts Council and also at our department put together to give people a basic idea about how to do video recording. So I'm gonna screen share with you to show you that guide and, and we're gonna drop the link to this guide in the chat box too. But here we have our COVID-19 content resource guide for artists. And this, um, this guide starts with the most basic kind of information, which is, you know, how to use your smartphone to record content. One of the positives about the age that we live in right now is that many people have a device that they use every single day that can help them present their work to the world and is the smartphone. Um, you know, I'm going to walk you through some basic 101 tips that we use to advise people. And if you have questions in the chat, I'll get in there afterwards to answer them. But one thing we would like to do, um, we recommend is that when you record content, if you're using your phone, always record a horizontal video. You can go into the settings on the back end of your phone and make sure that you're recording it at the highest frame rate possible, which we recommend 1080p, 30 frames per second for recording on your cell phone. Um, composition 101. So we use the rule of thirds when framing a shot. There's so much online content these days. We um, are constantly trying to make sure that ours looks good and rises to the top. And I think that's one of the important things that um, all teaching artists and artists out there should think about when they are developing online content. So basic rule, um, use the rule of thirds. So keep your subject in the third of the screen. Don't cut people's heads off. Um, don't allow too much negative space over people's heads. This is all included in this guide. Lighting 101, try to shoot with the sun or a window in front of you, not behind you. So you wanna be well lit. I know a lot of people these days are investing in ring lights, which you can set up on your computer monitor or on your desk, which give you a, a nice lighting situation for either webinars like this one or um, online content. And if you're shooting with your phone, instead of using the zoom function where you zoom in like this, do what you can to actually just get your phone as close to the subject that you're shooting as possible. Recommended basic equipment, a tripod for your phone if you can have one. Um, you can even create a, a DIY tripod at home, which you set like on a, pla a plastic cup. Definitely have done that before. And if you plan to incorporate in this work, this work into your repertoire, we also recommend that investing in a um, affordable lavalier mic, which makes sure the sound that you have is coming through clearly. And this is especially important we found with performing artists who are um, moving around or incorporating multiple different types of instruments into the shot. Tinkering with the sound and getting it right is really important because 
regardless of how fast the technology is evolving these days, um, you're still compressing sound and shooting it across the internet. So the integrity of the audio can really be improved if you are using a mic and running it through your phone or through your computer or through your camera, however you're recording. This guide also outlines some content strategies for pushing work. Uh, this was customized specifically for artists who may be trying to use this to monetize their work. Um, so you can explore those guidelines and recommendations in this document. And then I just wanted to touch on some of the most common uh, platforms that we're seeing people pushing content these days. So Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Today we're broadcasting through Zoom, but we're pushing this live stream out to our Facebook audience. Facebook is where the arts council specifically has our biggest following, which is one of the reasons why it makes sense for us to push to that platform. So when you're thinking about what platform makes the most sense for you as you develop this content and meet your audience where they are, I encourage you to lean into where you've already built um, audiences. And in many cases, you guys might be working with schools. So that's a whole different ball game. Um, and one note, and this is kind of a great way for me to lateral over to Eileen, but Facebook and YouTube have closed captioning services that they offer um, in post-production. So if you upload something, actually, I think Facebook can in real time translate what people are saying, which is an accessibility feature that we really like. And I know YouTube has one of the best um, auto-generated closed captioning services out there. So I'm going to throw this over to Eileen right now who can talk more about accessibility and the importance of that when generating online arts council or online arts content. Um, so hi folks and thanks Sandra for the introduction. Um, my name is Eileen Chang and I'm the grant systems and website manager for the North Carolina Arts Council and as Sandra mentioned I do a little graphic design for the agency as well. Um, so this guide, um, you know, this, this content, accessibility content came about when my, col um, my colleague, Kathleen Collier, who's both the agency's accessibility coordinator and visual arts director, wanted to offer guidance to our community on what to keep in mind um, for making online engagements more accessible. If you bear with me for a moment, I'm gonna share um, with you an excerpts, a mix up with a guide and some additional information on sort of best practices for um, accessible online engagement. And um, you can find this guide um, on our website. Um, on it's, you can get to it off of the main homepage um, at ncrsat.org. It's under the Arts and COVID-19 Resources banner on the homepage. And um, we'll probably share that link with you all soon via chat as well. All right. So here's the cover of the guide. It looks very similar to the content resources guide that we posted earlier, uh, maintaining agency design uniform uniformity. Um, and so I want to talk about a little bit about why it's important to be mindful of accessibility and who might benefit from inclusive practices. Um, there's a lot of incentive on the legal side of things. A civil rights law called the Americans with Disabilities Act um, protects the rights of individuals with disability and prohibits discrimination against them on the basis of dis their disability. The law celebrated its 30th anniversary just a couple weeks ago on July 26. And then there's the numbers. According to 2018 data from the US Census Bureau, approximately 12.6% of the US population reported some form of disability. And these disabilities you know, fall in the category ranging from hearing to visual impairments to cognitive disability. Um, and that 12.6% number translates to about um, 40 million people when you take into account the, um, the entire population in the US, which I think at last count is something somewhere in the ballpark of 330 million. And those who reported a disability in this particular survey were also likely referring to a permanent disability. If you consider the spectrum of people um, 
whose impairment may be transient, say if they have a ear infection and they suffer a temporary hearing loss because of it, or it's a situational impairment where they're just in a really uh, loud place and unable to hear very well, um, those who could benefit from accessibility practices grow to be much more than that um, 40 million count. And I just wanna go back real quick to my previous slide. 12.6% um, is the overall sort of average reported disability across the US. Um, the map you're seeing on screen now gives a finer breakdown um, across this a percentage by state. So hopefully everything that I've just talked about so far um, are pretty compelling reasons for um, why we should keep accessibility in mind. Um, but what are some more concrete things you can, um, you can do to make content more accessible? In terms of running um, live streamed and streamed performances, a really good place to start is to have um, captions. And captions can benefit a spectrum of people. Um, they're helpful for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, for folks with cognitive processing impairments, um, and for people, um, say for folks for whom English is not their first language, I know for me personally, English is not my first language and um, having captions on screen to follow along was really helpful for me when I was little and learning the language and it really helped me with comprehension and I still turn captions on whenever they're available. Um, so in terms of captions, live captions are the best practice, but traditional captioning services that are done by um, sort of professional human captioners, um, they can be quite expensive depending on what you go with. And I know last I checked, they were running anywhere from like a little over a dollar to maybe five bucks per minute. Um, however, there's been a lot of recent advancements in AI technology. Um, I think Sandra touched on this a little bit, but um, they, so these advancements have made these captioning services a lot more affordable. And there's two um, of such AI power services that we've tried. One of them is um, Rev.com, um, and the other one is Otter AI. Um, so both of these are um, subscription based instead of by the you know by the minute. So you just pay a flat rate of anywhere from ten to thirty dollars a month, depending on which service you end up choosing. You could subscribe month to month. Um, you could cancel at any time. There's no strings attached with these um, services. And um, Rev.com's Rev live caption platform is platform specific. So um, they do, um, their program integrates with Zoom meetings. And at the moment, um, this sort of live captioning model is available for Zoom meetings only. Whereas Otter AI is more of a general use live transcription tool that you could sort of use across different platforms. You could use it on Zoom, um, WebEx. So these I'm, th these I'm thinking are kind of the more maybe popular workshop um, platforms that people have been using. Um, you could probably use it for things like Instagram, Instagram Live as well. Um, and Otter AI is what we're using today for live transcriptions. Um, so the link was shared earlier um, in, the, in the chat area and I will share that with you again. And if you wanna try it out and take a look there, it's a little bit different from those um, traditional on-screen captions you may be used to seeing where the caption displays on the lower third of this screen. Um, this is what Otter AI does, what's called a um, live uh, transcript, where the transcript um, opens up in a different browser window and uh, it gives you like a live time stamped um, running transcript of, um, of what's, what's being, you know, the audio that's being recorded. Um, then there's Relay NC. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide for that, um, but it's a service that is free to North Carolina residents who are deaf or hard of hearing, and they can do relay captioning um, for webinars and conference calls. 
Now, if you're running your event in something like Google Meeting or Microsoft Teams, then you are um, all set. There's built-in um, live captioning functions in, the, in those two platforms, um, Google Meeting and Microsoft Teams. So all you have to do is find those options and turn it on and it'll automatically do, I believe, on-screen captions for your events. Um, you can easily caption your recorded videos as well. I know Sandra mentioned this a little earlier. YouTube and Facebook um, are two platforms that I know of that auto generates um, uploaded, um, uh, auto captions sort of uploaded videos. You just turn those options on um, when you go to edit your videos and, um, and they'll show up and they'll show up as an option for your viewers on screen. Um, but with any of these auto generated AI power captions or transcriptions, um, always take a minute to check them for accuracy before you publish because they are, although it is, you know, these are very, very pretty highly accurate transcripts done by AI, there's still room for error there. I, I believe the accuracy is somewhere in the 80, like low 90s percentile. So just remember to check them for accuracy um, before you publish. Um, and some... All right, I think we just lost iLink. So here we are having one of those tech um, issues that we talked about that can come up in these moments. And the beauty of doing live online content in this age is that people are accustomed to this and are down to roll with it. So I actually have the rest of her of editing the captions and doing okay. a read before publishing. Live. Great, thank you, Sandra. And sorry about that. Um... Yes, wonders of technology. It does. It's wonderful when it works, and then there are hiccups. Um, so, all right. On um, so back to sort of um, again checking for accuracy before publishing your captions, because again, I think at the moment there's still only about eighty or early, like low nineties um, accuracy rate for AI generated captions, and even with professional um, human power captions they're still, um, it's still not, you know, 100% accurate. Um, beyond captions, um, there are other things you can do um, include getting a American Sign Language interpreter for your event. Um, with webinars, it should be pretty easy to share your screen side by side with a event um, displaying alongside an ASL interpreter. And a list of registered ASL interpreters can be found on the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services site and also on the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. And there's also say audio descriptions, which are very helpful for folks who are blind or have low vision. Audio descriptions, um, they kind of paint the scene with words. Um, just think in line, along the line of, say, a podcast where you're, the audience is relying on the audio alone. It is typically offered as a separate audio track with additional um, spoken descriptions on top of the dialogue to give um, context to a scene. And you can um, actually find this if you, next time you're watching something on Netflix or, some, or another streaming service, um, look for the audio description, audio track option and see what that see what that sounds like. I don't believe that YouTube uh, platforms like YouTube currently offer this kind of multi-track audio support. So a workaround maybe to just create two separate videos and one with enhanced audio um, descriptions. And for that, you could check out um, Arts Access as a resource. Um, I put the link here. They're at artsaccessinc.org. Um, they provide audio description services and they also train people 
on how to do audio descriptions. Um, Arts Access does kind of pretty great work in general um, as their mission is to enable North Carolinians with disabilities to have full access to arts programs. And they have, also have a lot of great general accessibility resources on their website. And lastly, you can provide um, transcripts um, to your event, which would be super easy to do. If you have a tool like Otter AI, you can upload your audio or video and in, into Otter AI and it'll automatically generate a timestamp um, transcript for you. Um, again, check it for accuracy before publishing, but otherwise it's, it's a great time saver. Um, so just to wrap it up, I encourage all of you to go out and try out some of the tools that I mentioned, um, and please do check out our digital accessibility toolkit. Um, again, you could get to that off of our main um, homepage off ncarts.org. We have tips, but there's actually a lot more information on the toolkit. There's tips there on creating more accessible social media posts and for additional links and resources. Um, and sort of like what Santa was talking about earlier, a lot of the tools we talk about are platform specific and the technology here in this field changes really, really quickly. So there's bound to be things that we don't know about, um, or maybe that, you know, you know, maybe that are new and coming up. So if you come across anything that we haven't shared and that we should know, um, please let us know. Thanks. Lenora, I think we have another poll. Okay, yes, you are right. So everyone, thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. And thank you very much, Sandra. Sandra, that was wonderful news. I was copying and pasting the links myself. Okay, so you should see a, a poll come up on your screen um, in just a moment. Lenora, you need to start your video. Oh. See, look at there. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a, our second poll for the panel, uh, for all of our attendees. And please answer these. I'll talk uh, more slowly this time. The biggest challenge for me with going virtual is comfort with the necessary equipment, equipment and software number one. Number two, how to deliver my work in a high quality experience. Number three, the biggest challenge for me with going virtual is how to best connect my work to schools and organizations. And last, lastly, the biggest challenge for me with going virtual is all of the above. If you are on Facebook, please type your response into the chat. Okay, and here are the results. Wow, okay. So our, our best choice here, how to deliver my work in a high quality experience. 45% of you said that that was the biggest challenge for you going virtual. And then the, uh, the, the other two that were kind of closely behind are how to best connect my work to schools. That was a big challenge in going virtual or all of the above. And only a few of you um, said a big challenge was comfort with the necessary equipment and software. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sharon, it's all yours. And now I'm really excited to introduce our next guest. Uh, we've brought in a couple stellar artists for you to uh, hear how they are using virtual work and sharing their artwork across the state and the country. Um, both of these artists are cartwheels artists. If you're familiar with the programs with the North Carolina Arts Council, they're very experienced teaching artists. Hobie Ford is a world known uh, puppeteer and teaching artist and has written books and is just an amazing, uh, has an amazing wealth of knowledge to share. Pierce Freelon is joining us. He's a musician, presenter, animator, super dad. He does everything. So I'm going to turn it over to Hobie. All right. Thank you, Sharon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, when I was a little boy, 
I wanted to be a filmmaker and I had a Super 8 camera and I ran around and then uh, did that. And then I moved toward the arts and eventually to puppetry. And now I find myself 42 years later into this career being a filmmaker all over again. And, and so it's been a lot of fun and challenging as well. So I wanna share with you uh, a few things we, uh, uh, about equipment and software and then uh, about approach to how we create our videos. Um, there was a, a, a good talk about video cameras uh, with your mobile phone. And uh, with that, I'm going to um, leave a chat record here of um, on my video chat. Let's see, here we go. I'm putting up some links and one of these links, let me see if that worked. Two long panelists, let's see. Are you seeing that? Did that come up? No. Okay. I'm going into chat and uh, let's see, sorry for that. All panelists, okay. You need to do all panelists and attendees. And attendees, okay. Got it, okay. Now let's see if I can get that to paste. It's not pasting. Let me take a second more and get that. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay. So uh, a good friend of mine, Kira Bursky, is a young filmmaker in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. She's in the process of moving to Greenville, South Carolina. But she does offer a wonderful um, $30 workshop in, that's, okay, yeah. I'm not able to post, paste that in, I'm afraid. I'm going to uh, email it uh, in a second to um, Sharon and see if she can get that up. So um, Kira offers a, a workshop on how to create movies with your cell phone. Um, there's a lot of really good equipment and software going out there, but your phone has great, great attributes that are easy to use. And um, the other thing I've used is the camera on my uh, computer to create videos. Um, you can even use an older pre-digital uh, camera with the small cassette tapes, uh, maybe newer than VHS, and then get a little adapter for your computer to digitize those videos. Um, one of the things that I uh, also um, interested a lot in are softwares that you can use. So um, to edit your movies, if you're on a Mac, I, uh, iMovie works great. Um, there is a Windows equivalent app that you can also Google free video editing apps. And then finally, if you really want to get into it, there's a, a professional video uh, software called Final Cut Pro, and there was a free trial and the free trial on that allows you to um, have that software at your use disposal for about three months, which is really great. And uh, I've been using that one lately. If you buy that software, it ends up costing only about, oh, maybe uh, $400 maximum. So it's not terrifically expensive. Um, so Let's see, my computer seems to be locked up with sharing things. Uh, see if I can get that working. Um, so um, one of the things that I like to do with when I'm creating video tapes, um, when we were pre-COVID, I would go to a school and offer them a free performance or performances and then bring along a video, uh, video video camera or someone to videotape my work. And each time I did the performance, I would set the camera up in a different way. I'm gonna show you an example of, of this here in a second. Um, with uh, some, some video from my performance of Animalia, here we go.
And you'll see during this video how um, we've switched camera views. <laughs> So um, there, there was one video edit during that, that whole piece. I'm going to share another one. Um, let's see, here we go. He began to run across the island. On your marks, get set, go! It felt like he was flying. So you can see uh, when, if you just put a camera up in front of your performance, the uh, the problem is it it becomes very static, and we're we're used to performing live, but um, when we're turning to video, we need to add some of those production values. And so I would just set up different cameras and or perform the show two or three times in my shop all by myself, and then I would have those at my disposal. Um, some of the uh, other things that we can do uh, with our work is uh, workshop videos, uh, but also auditions. So in Wake County, North Carolina, there is a showcase coming up and I have about three, two or three minutes to present a video there. And so uh, when I'm using, uh, when I'm doing that, I, I chose to have a little bit of a, uh, a voiceover um, and just present my video that way. So I'm gonna show you an example of that. Get that going here. Uh, let's see. Here we go. There's a, a five minute audition tape that I created for that. The first story I'd like to share is nonverbal. It's an original story called Sea Song. It's the story of a boy addicted to video games. The boy is sent to spend the summer with his grandmother at a remote beach house. When the boy's phone is washed away, his grandmother tells him stories of when she was a girl and loved sea turtles. Soon the boy becomes fascinated with the sea turtles himself and learns all about their life cycles.
Okay, so uh, there we have a, um, a sample of uh, a video showcase. Um, and, and then um, I was thinking about um, different art forms uh, where it's harder to, to be a teacher or um, when you're working, let's say with a chorus, a, a choral group. One of my favorite uh, performance groups online is PS22. It's a public school in Staten Island and they put together wonderful concerts with the children and uh, I'd like to share with you um, one of their approaches, how they did this during COVID. So the teacher sent out a live video recording of him, uh, a video recording pre-recorded of himself singing the song, um, started with a count off and clap, and then began. And the clap was like sort of the clicker that they do in movies to make a little sound to show you that um, they can synchronize all of those together. He sent them out in different parts, the soprano part, et cetera. And then the kids just sang along with him and they clapped when he clapped, one, two, three, clap, something like that. And then um, he took all of those and then using a video, uh, a multi-window video option that is on a lot of softwares, iMovie has it. If you um, want to create something like that, just Google do a Google search on multi-screen presentations, video editing, and there are many free apps that will do it for you. So I wanna play you a little of his chorus. And the beauty of this is look at the kids' faces. And when he auditions the kids, um, he asks for, um, for them not only to be great singers, maybe that's not even important, but he wants them to be very expressive. So I'm gonna share you an example of that. recommend you check out uh, that video and um, I will be sending those links to Sharon in a second here uh, while Pierce is talking. And um, so uh, finally, one of the things that I've really uh, liked about this period of COVID and using film as a, a performance medium is that some of my very favorite work is miniature work. It's very small. It's not suitable to a live theater stage, but now with a camera, I can, I can do that sort of thing. And so if we think about this with other art forms and uh, let's say uh, a musician who, who might play a thumb piano, you could have close-ups of, of, of that and close-ups of what is actually going on on stage that they might not even see in a live performance that we can offer them in one of these pre-recorded uh, videos. So I'm gonna share a little of one of those here. Um, I have a little character I created about 43 years ago named Quagmire Ankle Deep, and he has a little dog named Chester. And uh, we'll see what they have to offer us right now. Here we go. Thing 
here. Hi, Chester. It's Roasted Grasshopper tonight. I was just thinking about how we got to be so small. I'll never forget that old muddy blackwater swamp where we first met. I wish we'd never ventured out that night. We might never cross tracks of that old mad madam bootlegger Maggie. Who would have thought that demented old Maggie was magic? I was suspicious right away when we reached that rotten shakedown shanty shack and Mad Maggie stepped out with two one-eyed cats. Maggie's old green teeth were sticking out in all directions, flashing in the moonlight like foxfire. I wasn't scared, maybe a little bit nervous, and I wish I'd never touched that mason jar of Maggie's moonshine. It was voodoo liquor for sure, probably made from toadstools. As soon as my lips touched that mason jar, everything is fuzzy as a fruit fly after that, but I do remember the old hag as she began weaving and dancing and dipsy-doodling and pushing that one-eyed cat in my face. Chester, I think you did something to rile her. Don't you look away now, partner. You were part of it, too. I do recall you also had your nose in that mason jar time. You didn't go and treat that crusty old cockeyed cat, did you? The moon went behind. Okay, so um, that's a story not for little children, actually. That one uh, is going out to um, uh, creating a, a Saturday morning cartoon uh, uh, series for, uh, for, uh, of puppetry instead of real cartoons. So, uh, but that's been a lot of fun working with that. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is how we retain our protect our materials when we send them out there. So I've, I have a couple of strategies. I use unlisted YouTube channels um, to send out video where those uh, links can be changed later on down the line so they're no longer accessible. I also keep all my digital content on different Google Drives and will share them with people um, for a specific time. And then periodically I'll go back and change out and reload them into another file so that um, those links are no longer live. Um, and just to, to try to keep a handle on not letting all of a sudden your material turn up on face on uh, YouTube or something like that. Anyway, I'm gonna uh, pass this on back to our host. And if you have any questions, in the meantime, I'll put up those links with Sharon. Thanks a bunch. Thank you so much, Hobie. Those are wonderful examples. And I think we're going to have some questions in the discussion in a few minutes. Um, I want to pass it over to um, Pierce now. He's going to share some of his work and processes with you. Cool. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, thanks, Hobie. It was great seeing some of your work. Um, how's everybody doing? My name is Pierce Freelon. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I really, I just want to say for the Arts Council, I really am digging your resource guide because there's a lot of important information in there. And I, I, I hadn't seen the guide before you kind of went through it before this presentation. And actually a lot of the stuff I was going to share is stuff that was already in that guide. So you made my job a little bit easier. I'll just have a, a good time showing you. I actually have many of the things that were mentioned in that guide. I actually have right here around me. So I'll just do a little round robin and show you what my home studio space looks like. I'll start with the, my ring light. Okay, so one of the reasons my face is looking so bright and shiny is because um, right on the other side of my camera, I have a ring light um, and it really comes in handy. It can do white light or yellow light and kind of change the temperature with a little remote. Um, and it really helps enhance the quality of your videos. Um, and I do quite a lot on Zoom, but more importantly, I do a lot with this, my DSLR uh, Canon 5D Mark III. Uh, it's really important when you have a, a, a camera, whether it's something like this or something like this, your phone, that you have good lighting. Um, another thing that you mentioned was uh, like a, a microphone, a lapel mic. I brought my Zoom recorder, which is just a kind of a simple mic you can use. People do this uh, with podcasts. Uh, personally, 
I like to attach it with a lapel microphone, which you can clip to your jacket. It's the kind of thing you'd wear if you were doing an interview at a you know news station or uh, something like that. Um, a good videographer, a buddy of mine, Salim Rushenwala, told me that um, you know sound is one of the most important things. Lighting and sound are two things that can make or break your video because if it looks stunning but the sound isn't that good. Um, it, it'll turn your viewers off and, and really reduce the quality of their experience. Uh, and likewise, uh, he actually said, I'd rather have poor visuals and great audio than the other way around, but why not have both if you can? So um, yeah, other things, I've got my microphone here, which, um, which I use quite a bit when I'm doing interviews, when I'm recording voiceovers and doing performances. It helps to have something a little nicer than your standard uh, laptop mic, which I'm sure you can hear me pretty clearly now, but the, the sound quality on that mic is an order of magnitude higher and nicer. Um, I have here my trusty tripod, which is great for my camera, but also if you look at the top here, this is a, a phone clip. So I can slide my phone into here and do all types of stuff without having to have someone you know, hold my phone. It's a great quick way to kind of engage. So, I mean, literally all this was in the resource guide and, and uh, I'm glad that y'all have that. It takes a big investment. Um, I had, lucky for me, I had a lot of this stuff before COVID, but I, I did not have the tripod with the camera holder, uh, nor did I have a green screen, which I'm not in the green screen room now because the acoustics in there aren't as good. Um, but I also invested in a green screen, which, uh, you know, with a little video editing tech savvy can allow you to be anywhere, <laughs> everywhere, uh, because you can make the green disappear and, and project whatever image you want onto that background. So the first thing I wanted to do after kind of giving you a review of some of the tools that I use was uh, to show you some of the results, some of the things that I uh that I use to make videos. And just to give you a, a heads up about what's in use in this video that I'm showing you, I'm using the ring light. I'm using my Canon 5D camera with a tripod uh, and I'm using my lapel mic. So uh, now that we've kind of gone through what all those things are, take a look at how uh, they function in practice in creating an experience that is uh, you know, kind of high quality, interactive, engaging digital content. I hope it's those things. Maybe you could tell me if it is or isn't. So I'm going to get my optimize together. All right. Share my screen. So check this out. Peace, love, respect. I'm going to talk about the song Tuck Me In. It's the first song off my children's album, Dad. This song was built around a voice note of Stella, me trying to put Stella uh, to bed, and she's freaking out. I want to go downstairs. Why? Because I don't want to sleep. She says, I don't want to sleep. I don't know, parents, can you relate? Kids like one parent to do certain types of things, and for whatever reason, mom is the bedtime lady. This song basically talks about all the reasons, all the excuses that a child will give you about why they don't want to go to bed. There's monsters in the closet. I need to go to the bathroom. Can you get me a glass of water? Any, it seems like they would do anything they could possibly do in order to stay up just another one or two or three or five minutes because going to bed is so dreadful. So kids, this is for you. You may hate going to bed now, but in the future, naps, Naps though, like naps, you can't beat them. So you may hate it now, but you're gonna love it later. So an important part of the beat is the And then if you listen, there's also like a So it's like a polyrhythm. When I was uh, in the studio, just thinking about sleepy time, that, that whisper. Okay, so that was just a little clip. Um... Let's see, how do I take screen? Okay, so, um, all right, I'm trying to take screen share off and come back. Okay, well, you can still hear me. Um, in fact, I'll leave screen share up. Oh, here it is, stop share. 
I'll leave screen share up so you can kind of, I can narrate while I'm explaining some of the things that, uh, that I've got going on. So uh, in that video, you kind of see um, me breaking down one of the songs from a children's music album that I worked on. Uh, it's still a video that's in progress. I still have some post-production to do and to add to it, but um, that'll just kind of give you an idea of how um, even though I'm not able to, you know, to come and, and engage with folks in person, I'm actually creating new content by going deeper into my catalog. I'm taking songs that I would normally sing in front of a group, and I'm creating unique content by almost like stripping away the layers behind the creative process and saying, this is what went on in that song. This is how I made it. Um, and it's important for me, I think, for artists, and I guess this is bigger than, um, this is bigger than uh, social, uh, or sorry, bigger than COVID, it's building a social media profile and building a social media platform that gives you an audience and an opportunity to engage with folks, whether there's a live venue for you or not. And so that's a good segue for the next thing I wanted to share which is my mother. Um, I'm here on my mom's Facebook page. I'm one of her pages uh, administrators. And she said, I wanna do a virtual concert. She wanted to do, uh, shortly before COVID, we were talking about doing a concert in collaboration with the Durham Senior Center for Senior Life. And so we did this concert at North Star Church of the Arts, which is a venue in Durham. Uh, the technology I used here uh, is a Mevo. It's a it's a type of camera, M-E-V-O. It's a type of camera that's specifically made for live streaming. And you'll notice I can do things like zoom and pan, but there's no, there aren't multiple cameras here. It's just me on my phone with an app that's allowing me to do the zooming and the panning uh, from uh, an iPad or a phone. Uh, so this is my mother, Nina Freelon, uh, doing a trio concert, six feet apart. Uh, at North Star Church of the Arts for the Durham Center for Senior Life. And, and we broadcast this on Facebook. It was very successful. It's, I think it's up to eight or 9,000 views. Um, and you know, she's like a huge jazz singer. So she's got that audience already. But for those of you, you know, uh, with a hundred followers on Facebook, you know, try to, try to put out content that's gonna help you build that following. So these folks can kind of hang with you regardless of uh, when we get back to doing live performances. So with no further ado, here's a snippet from my mom's concert where I was doing the back end. Okay, that was my mom, uh, Nina Freelon. I'll bring it back to the video now that I know how to do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, this is uh, just kind of another example of um, some of the kind of creative ways you can continue to, to be engaged with your audience. Again, that was a, that was a concert that was uh, kind of broadcast by, in collaboration with the Durham Center for Senior Life and also uh, with North Star Church of the Arts as a co-presenter. 
Um, and I think we had another, I can't remember if there was a third. Oh, I guess my mom herself, Nina Freelon, her own manager and her own brand was involved in that as well. So we made like a collective Facebook group. Everybody promoted it. It was really great. Um, so uh, there's so much stuff I could share. Um, I, I just wanted to give you kind of one more little glimpse into someone that I thought was doing something really innovative. And I wanted to show you something from me, but also from other people like my mom and uh, another guy, a puppeteer, one of Hobie's uh, friends and colleagues, a guy who goes by the name Jigetto, and that's J-E Ghetto, J-E-G-H-E-T-T-O. Uh, he's a really amazing um, puppeteer, African-American. I think he's the next Jim Henson. Uh, and he came up with this really dope concept called Cell B. It's the social emotional learning bot. It was a project that he did in collaboration with um, the Durham uh, Library. And what I, what's really cool about Jigetto, I've had this experience as well. While a lot of folks' careers, uh, you know, as, as presenting musicians have come to a screeching halt because of COVID, Jigetto and I have both found a way to be active. I would say I, I'm probably just as busy, if not more busy, in different lanes than I was before COVID, but definitely doing commissions, doing concerts, creating content, um, you know, frequently. Um, not as frequently in the live space, but as frequently in terms of treating Instagram like a live space and Facebook and TikTok. I mean, I started doing TikTok videos with my son. You can go over to my uh, TikTok. And, and here's why this is important. You know, doing TikTok videos isn't just about learning the dances and engaging with folks. Like I'm, I'm selling a, a children's music album. So I'm garnering fans, I'm engaging my audience in dialogue, I'm on Twitter. I think millennials probably have a better uh, fix on this than, than folks of other generations because you didn't grow up with social media. I mean, we really didn't either, but I guess Facebook was invented when I was still in college, but we certainly were coming of age with uh, social media. And so it feels like almost an effortless extension of my art to continue to engage on, on social media platforms. But anyway, uh, last but not least, I do wanna share this, um, this clip of Jigetto with y'all. So, okay, this is History of White People in America, another project you should check out, but I don't have time to go into it. This is the music video for Daddy Daughter Day. Ah, here we go. Jigetto and the social emotional learning bot. So this was created in Jigetto's backyard, um, he's got a shed that he built. It's not very big. He built these puppets from scratch and he created the backgrounds um, on a program called Procreate, which is a, a digital uh, visual app where you can, it's kind of like a, you know, a poor man's uh, Photoshop. It's really easy to use. And um, he created the backgrounds with that. And he shot this in front of a green screen, just like I did my video in front of a green screen. So here's a, a couple clips from um, the end. One more thing I'll say about this, and then I'll shut up, is the, uh, the social emotional part of it. The curriculum is all about teaching people about how to deal with anger. You know, what is love? What is empathy? You know, so a really important thing for kids, especially during COVID, to, to have some training and some additional resources around. So shouts to Jigetto for this one, check it out. So that's just a brief glimpse. Um, if you want to learn more about Jigetto, you can check him out on um, uh, at his website, jigetto.com. 
Um, but yeah, just again, another kind of innovator. One of the things, one more thing I'll say about Jigeto that I think is really special, uh, you know, puppetry is, 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 a, is a very niche community and a special ancient art form, uh, but there aren't a lot of African-Americans in that space. And so when I watch his art, I can feel our culture as black people um, radiating through the work. I don't know about y'all, but when I was listening to that, my head was bopping, you know, the music, the, uh, the themes, the voice acting, all of it is from a black perspective, which, you know, when you've grown up with, with things like Sesame Street or, you know, Mr. Rogers or Pee Wee's Playhouse, and you know how powerful that is. But for me personally, to see that from a black perspective and a black creator is, uh, is really unique and special. So he's a great friend of mine. So uh, I told him I'd be shouting him out today. Um, but anyway, yeah, those are, I mean, I could go into so much more. I'm into animation. I've been doing a lot of uh, socially distant music videos and other kind of projects, but I'll pause there and uh, open things up for, I think we're doing some Q&A and I'll get y'all links and everything uh, as well. Everything that I showed y'all is uh, available. Actually, the first clip is not available on YouTube, but um, most of what I played is, you can Google it, but I'll give you links to the relevant things. Thank y'all. Awesome information, Pierce. Thank you so much for sharing. I think we could all watch the examples forever, but we have lots of good questions. If we can get everybody's faces back up here, can we bring uh, the gang up and unmute them? Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a few of the questions and uh, panelists, if, if you have a response, if you can put your hand up, that would be great. Um, one of the first ones way back and when we first started talking um, about, I think, Hobie, some of the work that you were doing, um, Ursula asked kind of a weird question, but sometimes it's hard not to look at my face when I'm doing a live stream via my laptop or when I'm talking on Zoom. Does it make a huge difference to look directly at the camera? Where is the best place to hold your gaze when doing a recording? So I, I, I really think that most of the time it's pretty ap applicable. I mean, if, if you're presenting some sort of work, you could look at your work and direct it there. Um, in puppetry, we direct our gaze where we want the viewer to look. So, um, so generally, it would you would want to look into the camera, but um, but there'd be times when you could you could you know be regarding something else, and and so that may just be a uh, you know maybe she doesn't like looking at her face looking, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, and I get I get. Uh, self-conscious that way. But I think eye to eye contact is pretty important for this. Definitely. Pierce, when you were doing the music videos, like for your kids album, um, was that something that you were consciously doing in terms of relating to the camera? Uh, yeah, I mean, as a performer, I think um, we're playing, especially, you know, in hip hop and in most music videos where you're rapping or performing or singing, to the camera, you want to imagine the audience thinking you're you're looking directly at them. So absolutely, you're you know you're giving them your undivided attention. <laughs> and um, you know when I'm on a Zoom call, I don't worry about looking at the camera. Like right now, uh, Sharon, I'm looking at your face, and 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 that I think that feels more like we're in the room together, mm -hmm. and and that you know we're not, which is one of the things that's hard about social distant virtual engagement. So whatever we can do to conjure that sense of uh, togetherness and close intimacy, I think will help enhance the uh, exchange. I agree, I agree. Um, one of the questions too uh, went back to uh, one of your video clips, um, Beverly Botsford asked you, um, how did you add the text? Did you use a green screen? Um, what was the technique that you used with the words on the screen? Oh yeah, sure. That's a great question. So uh, the same app that Jigeto used um, to create the backgrounds is uh, it's called um, Procreate, and uh, in that app, there's a great text function. You could use your finger, or you could use what's called an Apple Pen. And so I just wrote "boom chicka boom cha" 
<laughs> and then I and then I um, I rendered the background transparent, and then I exported one word at a time. So boom, chicka, boom, cha. I guess that's three words. Boom twice. Um, and uh, and then I uploaded those into my video editing software, and then um, frame by frame, as I was saying boom chicka boom cha, I placed the words boom chicka boom cha, and um, you know that creates this kind of live animated feel. Um, but yeah, I created that in a program called Procreate. Uh, but you could do that in Photoshop. There's a lot of programs. Any kind of write, writing or drawing tool. Um, you know, and you just make the background transparent. And, and this is important, I guess, as a technical thing. You have to export it as a PNG. A PNG is a, is a type of file. Normally, pictures are JPEGs. J, they have its whatever, the file name .jpg. A JPEG will give you a white background, um, but a PNG will give you a transparent background and allow you to place that image without any white behind it. It'll just be the letters themselves. So that's how I did that. I like the rhythm of it, that it matched the rhythm of, of, the, of what you were doing. It was beautiful. Um, Stacy had a question. I find iMove tutorials to be complicated. Can you recommend alternatives that are more step-by-step -step or easier to comprehend? Who would like to take that one? Uh, my go-to for any tutorial from, from how to work Zoom to how to fix my car is YouTube. And uh, YouTube has a, a video for everything. Literally everything, yeah. Sandra? I, I will say to that point, I use Adobe Premiere Pro for content that I edit for the Arts Council. And a lot of times I will have something I want to figure out how to do and usually go through about three links until I find the easiest explanation for it. Mm -hmm. And YouTube has a feature now where, um, they will highlight a passage that they think contains the nugget of information that you actually need. Because on some of these instructional videos, mm. the first two minutes mm -hmm. are the either the the host promoing their work or Yapping. Um, telling you how to turn on your computer and like go from there to how to put text on a video. So I echo YouTube. Hope you. Yeah, and and I'll, I'll I I think I can add as as someone who's used several programs. I in my opinion, um, Final Cut is more user friendly than Premiere, and um, iMovie is even more user friendly than Final Cut. So to if the root of your question is what's the easiest software, I I think that it doesn't get much simpler than iMovie. And if that's a if that's a challenge, yeah, I would encourage you, like like Sandra said, to seek out a a, a teacher that speaks in like the most layman's of layman's terms. And there was a question too about which audio editing platform you use. I, I will say that I um, have worked in radio previously and used Hindenburg, which is like a mid-tier platform. It's 90 bucks for a, a license, a permanent license. And it has all of the basic techniques that allow you to layer different tracks. It's not super sophisticated, but it's it, it offers more than say Audacity, which is another, that's an open source free software that anyone can use mm -hmm. to edit audio. And that's what I first started on. Um, so those are the two audio editing platforms that I use for audio content. And I don't know if anyone else, Pierce, if you had recommendations for your voiceover work or what, but. Yeah, Hindenburg is great. Um, I, I make beats, so I have sophisticated, complicated audio software that nobody is going to want if you just want to do something simple like voiceover. But I do think that Audacity, though free and open source and awesome for those reasons, is not very uh well designed or designed for user friendliness so i would uh, encourage you to make the investment on a hindenburg which like you said it's rare these days to get a software that you only have to pay for once and then you know it's not a subscription base so that that's a really good one and if you have a mac um it should come with garage band which is also pretty simple 
Mm -hmm. Great point. We, we had a lot of people asking, you know, because many of our artists are out of work now. So how to keep this process as affordable as possible. Do you have a good recommendation for an affordable wireless mic that might be used? This was the second part of that question that I missed that could be used for something with movement base. So mm -hmm. like dance class. That's a good question. Sandra? I just yes. want to say, I, I don't specifically, but I just want to plug your local camera store, mm. uh, audio visual store in this moment, because I, I heavily rely on mine for um, advice on what equipment will get me where I need to be most affordably. So if you have one of those in your community, I use Southeastern Camera and Carbro and Raleigh, but there, there are a number, um, they're great resources for questions like that. So you can also go online, but, and, and I wish I had an answer for that, um, but I know that they're the type of businesses that still need support Yeah. now more than ever. So just wanted to plug them. Support your local economy. I have a question for both of the panelists, if I could, Sharon. Sure. Um, uh, so both of you used music in the in the materials that you shared with us. What do you collaborate with local artists to provide your music? I know Pierce. Sometimes um, you have access to more musicians, maybe than the the normal teaching artist. But Hobie, you also used some beautiful music in your work. So do you open the opportunity to collaborate or where do you get your music from? Whenever I can, I use local musicians. So with my El Coqui piece from Puerto Rico, um, I got a Puerto Rican musician to come in and, and just nail the music first time. And then other times I'll license the music from, from artists that uh, uh, the, the little uh, sea song, the little piece on the beach, um, that was a, a hong drum player from Germany. And um, usually when you go directly to the musicians, especially not world famous ones, you know, they're really excited to get their music out there. And so I would first look locally and then, um, and then eventually work up to, you know, licensing it from some big record company, uh, that, that sort of thing. And then just on the microphones, I don't know that there's a cheap way of getting a wireless microphone. Sure makes a, a, a system, a dual diversity system, uh, wireless mic for about 300 bucks. And I, I just think that it's not something you can get really cheaply and expect it to be decent at all. Yeah, the, um, the only thing I'll add to what Hobie's already said is that um, there are some folks out there who will license their music for free uh, with, through what's called a Creative Commons license. And um, you know if you just Google open source uh, or free, um, music licensing or, um, you know, the, they separate it by categories and they'll offer you a certain amount for free. And then once you see how good it is for a small fee, you can opt into getting more. But if you just need a little something, as long as you give the folks credit, there will be plenty of uh, open source Creative Commons opportunities out there. But that being said, totally support your local artists first if you can, if you have the budget. Yeah. Um, and that goes up oh, sorry that goes in um the it's the same for if you just need a piece of graphic or some um some visual like you know nice visual graphics for for your um content pieces as well there's a lot of free resources online again like what pierce mentioned under creative um creative commons licenses so they're free to use and royalty free as long as you give them some credit um so that's available out there as well it's great um, I think we have time for one more question um, from Alan Wolf. Any ideas from the panelists regarding creating asynchronous content, for example, pre-made videos of performances or demonstrations meant to be paired with synchronous offerings, for example, virtual a virtual visit with classes or in Zoom meetings? Seems like this is a good way to connect to schools and work over the course of a few days. Thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in. Um, so one of the things my band, The Beast, is discussing 
is like a menu of, of options at different price points for schools in the fall to kind of engage with our, our curriculums digitally. Uh, and so at the lowest price point would be something pre-made that we send them. And like Kobe said, it could be a link that we make public for a short amount of time or a, drop, a, a Google Drive file that they have access to for a limited amount of time. A tier above that would be a, an interactive version of the performance. So you, know, you send the video, but you also are available for a live Q&A or for some activities in between segments. Um, you know, and your presence there would, would merit the increased fee. And then there's, a, there's even, a, a, I think, a third tier with some kind of live streaming event um, where you could come similar to the concert you saw with Nina, where you have uh, the whole band comes together, runs the performance live, is able to take Q&A in real time. Maybe there's a point where you wanna stop the video and switch from a live stream to a screen share and play a video, come back to the live performance with some Q&A. So I think that um, we're gonna need to be innovative and nimble in that way, not only to accommodate the budgets of the uh, folks that are gonna be hiring, but also to uh, you know to be able to be versatile and give folks what feels like an interactive experience, even though we're you know on the internet. Yeah, and I've I've, I've worked with with all all the above, um, completely live, down to uh, then moving toward um, sending a recording and commenting and answering questions as it's playing to just sending the whole video. The, the, question, uh, the question came from Alan Wolf, who's a wonderful, uh, wonderful poet and, and uh, creative person. I'd be real curious what his own answer would be to that question, so. <laughs> we need a longer conversation, maybe an, a post-TAT conversation. Yeah. Um, we are about out of time and I wanna thank all of you. This has just been amazing. But before we go, I'd like to share something that kind of ties into the conversation and also moves us into next week or next week, two weeks away, uh, Teaching Artist Tuesday, which is going to be a session with um, the experts from the Department of Public Instruction and the Arts, and also some teaching artists um, that are doing the type of work that meets the needs of what we're calling social emotional learning while being artful in times of trauma. As you've heard, social emotional learning is a big deal this year or during the school year. Mm -hmm. So we're getting a lot of questions about that. The Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, which is where we are housed, did a survey with um, about 119 um, classroom teachers. And I wanna share those results with you because I think it's going to um, highlight some of what we've been talking about. Um, as you are going out and trying to share your uh, virtual material or as you're trying to communicate with them to find out what they need, some of these ideas are very, very important. So one of the first things that they discovered was that teachers, believe it or not, still prefer school email, 86% um, in terms of contacting them and reaching out. Uh, a lot of times we think that maybe they're not responding to us the way that they could. Um, what kind of resources are they looking for? They're looking for supplemental resources that support teaching standards. Over and over again, we're hearing that the most marketable work is going to be that work that supports teaching standards. If you don't know what those are, you can go to the website for the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction and they're just list there. Or email me and I will send you that link. They are also looking for short hands-on activity ideas connected to those standards. So that's another possibility for the video work that we're seeing um, coming out of many of our teaching artists. Um, a lot of you, are accustomed to going in and, and working with students live um, or going, they go to museums, which isn't gonna happen probably this year. So they are looking still for things that are correlated to school programming, very important. If you are developing workshops for teachers, 
what kind of professional development do they want? They want professional development courses that they can do on demand. So there's that recording factor that we were talking about earlier. So since there aren't gonna be likely any field trips this year, how do they want to connect with you? 36% they wanna connect with you virtually. 31% said they wanted to do it on demand. And 33% said they still want you in the school if you're allowed. So it's, it's kind of an equal mix there. And that's where it's really important for you to know your um, school system that you are intending to work with. Um, this was an interesting one, I thought, because we talk so much about what platforms are best to serve um, our programming. And the top chosen platforms forms for meetings, PDI, those kinds of things. It was Google Drive, YouTube, um, hang on, I can't see the other one, Google, and Zoom. So some of the others that we had uh, talked about in different settings were not, Google Meet, sorry, had to move us out from under uh, these spaces. Uh, the ideal length of po program, what are they looking for? 30 to 45 minutes which is not a surprise, that's kind of a basic class uh, length, or 30% said under 30 minutes. Um, so that to me would be maybe a more quick hands-on related to a performance, something like that. Uh, given the connectivity issues and schedules that schools are gonna be facing this year, 69% preferred on-demand virtual options because they just don't know what they're going to be encountering this school year. So I thought that information was useful. It kind of ties what we've been talking about to our next presentation. I hope you will join us. That's on the 25th of August, again at 3 p.m. And thank you so much to all our panelists and to our participants. We appreciate you very much. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.